Today's Live on Web episode, Winning the Logistics Game, is sponsored by Ryder and Telogis. game. I'm Seth Clevenger, Technology Editor at Transport Topics. Today we'll be looking at our newly released 2017 Top 50 ranking of the largest logistics companies in North America and analyzing the different strategies and companies that companies are using to get ahead in the competitive world of third-party logistics. With me is Dan Berth, TT's Senior Features Writer and the one who is responsible for compiling our Top 50 list. And we're also very happy to welcome Ashfaq Chowdhury, President of Supply Chain for the Americas and Asia Pacific at XPO Logistics, the new number one on our list. A bit later in the program, we'll also hear from an industry analyst and an executive with another company ranked on our top 50 list in pre-recorded interviews. Today's program is sponsored by Ryder Intelligis. We also invite you to participate in today's program. You can email your questions or comments to share at ttnews.com if you're watching on the web, you can comment on this page. And if you're watching via Facebook Live, simply enter your question in the comment box. So it's safe to say that the 2017 Transport Topics Top 50 Logistics Companies list is unlike any other we have published. That's because the company that's ranked number one is barely five years old. Investor Brad Jacobs created XPO Logistics in 2011 and from the beginning has pursued a goal of becoming the largest player in a business that he deemed to be highly fragmented and inefficient. He also recognized the demand for third-party logistics services was growing at a rapid clip, and he set out to create a different kind of logistics company. XBO's position at the top of this list is validation that the strategy has worked. We'll also talk today about other strategies that companies have used to succeed in the logistics game, specifically around the emergence of e-commerce fulfillment and the so-called Uberization of freight. But first, Dan, can you go ahead and give us an overview of the top 50 and uh, tell us a little bit more about the shakeup at the top? Certainly, Seth, thank you. Um, uh, since we published the first uh, top 50 list in 2002, only two companies have uh, ever held the top spot, uh, UPS Supply Chain Solutions and DHL Supply Chain. And uh, while both of these companies are still major logistics service providers today. Um, the fact that uh, XPO Logistics has surpassed both of them uh, feels a little bit like a changing of the guard in this industry. And it also feels like there's been a change in the competitive landscape uh, with UPS and FedEx, for example, uh, making major acquisitions in recent years to enhance their logistics capabilities. So, um, okay. Now, uh, beyond the top, uh, you know, we, we see some changes, but uh, once you get past that, there have been some other changes on the list this year, some, some new flavor. You know, can you talk us to that? Sure. I'd like to highlight the fact we have uh, two companies on the list this year that are, I think, unique. Mm -hmm. um, one is Radio, and the other is Ingram Micro Commerce and Fulfillment Solutions. Um, these are companies that specialize in e-commerce fulfillment, and this is a business that caters to the needs of companies that sell goods online, which includes, of course, a lot of retailers, uh, but is beginning to also cut into the industrial and wholesale business transactions as well. Uh, retail is uh, a huge industry in its own right and a major source of freight for, for trucking and logistics firms. So any change in the way goods are, are bought and sold, I believe, will have major repercussions for everyone in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, before we get much further down this conversation, uh, let's go ahead and bring Oshbach into the uh, mix here. Uh, you want to go ahead and lead things off, Dan? You bet. Um, Oshbach, you were um, a chief technology officer at a company called New Breed Logistics uh, when it was acquired by XPO in, in 2014. 
And New Breed was a top 50 logistics company in its own right at the time. Tell us what was your reaction to uh, becoming part of uh, a bigger uh, logistics enterprise like a XPO? Well, you know, uh, we were very excited. Uh, you know, XPO is not only uh, uh, a global company, it has uh, a lot of different services. And it was a public company. You know, we were private at the time. So um, we have uh, immediately found ourselves in a situation where we could do a lot more things for our customers that we couldn't do before. And uh, since then, as XPO has grown, our capability to do that has expanded. And our access to the largest customers in the world have expanded. So uh, overall, uh, it was a, uh, a really, really uh, a great event for us to become part of uh, a global leader. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about what has changed in terms of your capabilities? What can you do for shippers that you couldn't do before? So, uh, for example, uh, you know, we have now 87,000 employees in 34 countries. We're truly a global company. Um, as you know, in the world, uh, you know, the need for logistics and linking logistics across the world is, you know, continues to expand. We're all connected. And uh, XPO is one of the few companies in the world that can immediately answer that question. Um, the second thing is the scale brings with it resources, technology. We have, uh, we spend $425 million in technology each year. We have over 1,600 people in our technology group. So um, the level of access and resources that we have enable us to create much more flexible solutions for our customers. Most of our customers have emerging problems, a lot of new things that they are facing, and our approach is to partner with them and be able to pull all these resources um, and, and create solutions for them, and our ability to do that is much, much bigger today. You know, logistics uh, is an industry that uh, uh, continues to grow every year. I think uh, the latest estimate uh, that we got from Armstrong and Associates, uh, who's our partner in producing this list, um, is that in 2016, the total spending on third-party logistics was $166.1 billion. Um, um, Ashwak, I'd like to hear um, what your take is on the outlook for continued growth in this business. Maybe you could talk a little about uh, the extent to which you see shippers continuing to outsource these capabilities to uh, third-party companies such as yours. So, you know, we are growing at a pretty rapid pace, and uh, we are talking to a lot of uh, shippers and customers uh, around the world. Um, the world is getting more complex. And uh, in order to support the sort of the expanded needs of our customers' customers, we need more infrastructure and investment. So um, that is driving the, uh, the, the outsourcing trend more and more. Customers are looking for solutions and they are looking for third parties to come in and not only provide the expertise but also provide the investment in creating the next generation solutions that they need to be competitive in their business. And, uh, you know, our tagline's results matter. And, uh, you know, uh, we are very much focused on our customers' results and trying to make them successful. So uh, I see the trend uh, in the, in the third-party logistics business to continue to expand at a, at a reasonably good pace, probably, you know, in the high single digits or mid-teen range uh, for the next few years. Mm -hmm. Which is good. Um, now, before we go on, uh, maybe we can go ahead and hear what an industry analyst had to say about the logistics market and uh, the potential for more industry consolidation and growth. So, uh, earlier this week, Dan, you spoke with uh, John Larkin of Steeple, mm -hmm. and uh, he shared his outlook in a, in a conversation with you. So, let's go ahead and play that interview. A question about XPO Logistics, which uh, is a company uh, that uh, promised that, that it would um, uh, uh, consolidate the industry, and um, and it looks like it has achieved that goal, at least becoming the largest um, logistics company in North America. What's your reaction to what they've accomplished, and what does it mean, do you think, for uh, the transportation and logistics marketplace uh, in terms of possibly more consolidation, for example? Sure. Well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
I talked to Brad Jacobs before he actually started out on this uh, expedition, and his vision, um, it must have been seven or eight years ago, was to roll up the truck brokerage space and suggested to him that uh, you know, that was a risky strategy in light of the fact that you had some big players in the space already, not the least of which was C.H. Robinson, TQL, mm-hmm. um, Echo, to name a few. Um, but he thought I was wrong and went ahead with that strategy anyway. And then I think pretty quickly realized that you know it's going to be tough to, to buy top quality truck brokers at its preferred acquisition multiple, which is, you know, between six and eight times EBITDA. And right about at that time, along came a company called 3PD, which was owned by a private equity firm that was liquidating its holdings. And he ended up uh, buying, you know, one of the best positions, if not the best position, uh, last mile delivery companies. Right. 3PD and uh, kind of the rest is history after that point. Um, continued to buy companies that added to the breadth of services that XBO could offer its customers. You know, just to name a few, he bought Pacer, which gave him pretty, pretty solid intermodal capability. Um, Bridge Terminal Transport, which is a big drayage operation. Uh, bought New Breed, which which is a contract logistics uh, company extraordinaire, really uh, well run. Um, you know, bought bought some additional uh, companies along the way, but then then crowded it all off with the the two very large scale acquisitions, Norbert Dentrosangla, uh in France, and then Conway. And next thing you know, you wake up one day and XPO is a fifteen billion dollar revenue company. Mm-hmm. And instead of continuing to grow uh, kind of willy-nilly, they decided they would take a couple of years to really uh, come up with uh, a, a single branding across the whole organization. Um, you know, all the trucks, all the offices are being rebranded. Everybody is carrying around an XPO business card. Um, and um, I think uh, a lot of that integration has been accomplished here last year and will be finished off uh, this year. And uh, the customers seem to be reacting uh, to that single branding and the ability to provide the right mix of services to solve their logistics needs very positively. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a lot of respect for what Brad has accomplished, and uh, you know there was a time there when when people used to say this will never work. You know people have tried this before, yada yada yada. Uh, but but Brad, to his credit, through hard work um, and pulling together an A plus plus team, um, has has really made it work quite nicely in a relatively soft freight market. And you kind of say to yourself, gee, you know, how well would they have done if the freight market had provided some tailwinds instead of headwinds? Uh, of course, uh, a year from now, year and a half from now, two years from now, they may re-enter the M&A fray and, uh, you know, start adding additional bolt-on, tuck-in acquisitions, maybe, um, you know, a few acquisitions in new spaces where they currently don't have a capability. And uh, I think this this is a company that will, you know, set a, a fairly high bar for others to, um, you know, try try and eclipse, uh, given that they they do have a very interesting combination of services that seem to be especially well put together for what's what's being demanded out in the marketplace today. Yeah. So is this a playbook you think others can uh, emulate? Um, do you think it already has had an effect, perhaps, on what other companies are doing in this marketplace? Yeah. Historically, uh, acquisitions have had mixed results, I think, uh, mm-hmm. in this space. They're very difficult to integrate. Cultures are different. Systems are different. Uh, compensation models are, are different. Company cultures really uh, can be the the biggest factor here. Um, 
and and most people don't have the experience that that Brad Jacobs has in pulling companies uh, together like this via the acquisition model. But he had done uh, United Waste and United Rentals mm-hmm. uh, prior to XBO and really gained some invaluable um, experience. Um, I think also he's a very disciplined guy who likes to run uh, the business uh, uh, in sort of an old-fashioned manner where they have monthly reviews uh, at all the business units and they go through every line item in the income statement. And if you're off plan, you better have a good reason. And, uh, you know, we're going to come up with a strategy right now to make sure we get back on plan and back on plan quickly. So it's it's a <clears throat> very intense culture. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody works any harder at XPO than Brad himself does. We heard John Larkin talk about the growth of XPO Logistics. And we know that the company has taken a break from mergers and acquisitions, and it's focusing now on integrating the operations that it has acquired already. So, um, Ashraf, can you tell us how is the integration going, and what's next for the company when that process is complete? Okay. So, Dan, um, our company is squarely focused on organic growth. Uh, we're a $15 billion company with a trillion dollar market. So we have only 1.5% market share today. We see a lot of opportunity for us to grow. We have a lot of services that we can offer our customers that we already have. And we are very, very focused on continuing to do that. Uh, our contract logistics business had um, record sales last year. And uh, we are shooting for a even bigger uh, sales year this year. So uh, we feel that you know there's a huge energy and significant momentum for us in uh, driving organic growth in our business, and that is at this time our only focus. I see. Yeah, and of course there is optimism generally about the economy uh, with the new administration, uh, and so uh, a lot of people are concerned about. Uh, capacity going forward, right? There's uh, uh, concern about um, uh, the impact of the ELD mandate on uh, driver supply later this year. So you you talk to a lot of shippers. Are they concerned about capacity um, uh, now or in the future? Um, And what can they do about it? Well, um, you know, there's always concern. But, you know, as we have gone through a period in the last few quarters of fairly loose capacity, um, you know, we can see already that, you know, it is tightening up a little bit. I mean, I, I would characterize our current, you know, situation as more balanced. Yeah. Um, uh, as the ELD regulations come up, I think uh, the impact is somewhat unknown. I think uh, there's a, some concern that it's going to lose capacity, but there's also, um, you know, uh, a lot of folks that feel that it will not have as big an effect as people think. So. Uh, to be determined, but um, I, I would say that uh, I don't know that there is huge concern, but there is some, you know, people are tentative, they're watching what happens with capacity. All right. Um, trade is another big item uh, and, and a source of uncertainty in the market, let's face it, right? Uh, we don't know what the, the administration has planned for NAFTA or um, China. Uh, we may learn more about that later this week, uh, I suppose. Um, but. Uh, we know Brexit uh, has already occurred. Um, can you talk about um, what that might af- how that might affect the logistics market? I know XPO has a major operations in continental Europe. Right. Uh, uh, can you talk about Brexit a little bit and maybe what your outlook is for, for trade, cross-border yeah. trade? So, um, you know, I was uh, actually in Paris with our European team. We were having a worldwide, you know, leadership meeting right at the Brexit vote. So we got a very up-close, uh, you know, view of all the folks uh, in, in Europe about that. Uh, in the long run, I don't believe that it, it will have a major effect in terms of trade. Uh, you know, there are, up, there are ups and downs in trade. Where the effect is, is more in the complexity of the processes and so on. There will be more regulations. There will be differences in regulation. And that will have an effect on how we conduct business. So, uh, but, uh, you know, we will adapt to that, as will, you know, others in our business. Um, we don't see Brexit by itself really, you know, driving a huge change. In fact, uh, you know, right after that, as you saw, there was an initial kind of negative reaction. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it's actually went the other way. Uh, so uh, I think uh, overall, um, you know, it's not going to be a huge, huge effect. Okay. 
And for those All of right. us who have uh, you know, just joined us, to, we're here on uh, Live on Web's program on winning the logistics game. You know, we invite your uh, questions and contributions. You can send them to share at ttnews.com or uh, make your comments directly on this page. Uh, so we've, we're discussing our top 50 logistics list, and, and Dan, maybe you can uh, expand beyond uh, you know, the, our new number one and, and look at some of the other uh, companies in the top 10, and uh, maybe a few new players that you see on the list this year. Sure, be glad to. Um, uh, JB Hunt Transport Services is uh, ranked number two this year, um, and this is a company that's undergone a a remarkable transformation. Uh, many people in this industry uh, still remember when J.B. Hunt was the nation's largest for-hire truckload carrier. Now it's the nation's largest intermodal carrier and it's rapidly growing. It's uh, dedicated and freight brokerage business as well. So completely different company really. Um, one thing that I think to watch out for uh, is what happens with Schneider. Um, when it goes public later mm -hmm. this week, as a matter of fact, um, we may see a big push from that company to challenge J.B. Hunt's uh, dominance in intermodal and dedicated logistics. Um, UPS Supply Chain Solutions, I mentioned earlier in the program, has been ranked uh, number one on our list for most of the, the time that we've been doing this. It falls to number three this year, followed by DHL Supply Chain at number four. And then rounding out the top five is C.H. Robinson Worldwide, uh, which is another company uh, uh, to watch, uh, Seth, because um, it's adding new services like freight forwarding um, to its established portfolio of freight brokerage and, and produce distribution services. Um, it has a lot of potential. There are two companies on the list this year that uh, uh, are making their first appearance, right? One is called uh, Syncrean Holdings. Uh, it comes in at number 20, and it's a major provider of contract logistics services. Uh, they do a lot of business with the automotive industry, which has been very strong in the past few years. The other company is um, Black Horse Carriers uh, at number 37. And this is a dedicated contract carrier that specializes in food and beverage and auto parts distribution. Um, they do a lot of business with Aldi, if, if you're familiar with that grocery chain. So, okay. so yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it would also be helpful for our uh, viewers to understand how we compile this list, uh, this, this ranking of three PLs. There are different ways you could potentially do it, but we use net revenue, the you know, total revenue minus the, the cost of purchase transportation. So, Dan, you want to explain, you know, why we rank the companies this way, what's the rationale, and, uh, you know, what goes into to making that, that list? Sure. Um, uh, net revenue is a figure you, uh, uh, you may not always see uh, when companies report how much business they do because uh, they'll, they'll want to look bigger than they are, right? <laughs> but net revenue is, is money that is actually available to this company to actually operate the business. And so in our thinking, uh, it's the best way to measure a firm's overall size and its capabilities. Um, it's important to understand that the difference between net and gross revenue, uh, it's most pronounced uh, for firms that are involved with freight brokerage and forwarding because uh, in those circumstances, the actual transportation is being provided by another company. Um, uh, if you're in the warehousing and dedicated contract carriage business and you're using your own assets, there really is no difference between net and gross revenue. So. Um, that affects uh, the rankings uh, for those companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, one of the, the, really the top story in our Logistics 50 publication dealt with e-commerce fulfillment. Uh, we've been talking about that a little bit, but uh, Dan, could you maybe take us through why this is so important to the future of logistics? Sure. Um, e-commerce um, has the potential to alter many of the services that logistics companies provide from warehousing to order fulfillment to transportation management and final mile delivery. Uh, think of it as a new world order, if you will, right? Companies like Amazon are changing the rules of engagement uh, with consumers in terms of service, uh, speed of delivery, pricing. So logistics companies, which help companies 
uh, move goods through the supply chain, they have to adapt uh, to this new environment. So um, we have a system in place uh, where goods traditionally have moved in quantity from manufacturers to wholesalers and, and retail distributors. Um, uh, and we're moving to a system now where uh, uh, goods move in smaller quantities uh, from producers directly to consumers, right? Mm -hmm. So this requires, you know, a new way of, of thinking about where you want to store goods, uh, uh, how you, uh, how long you keep them in uh, in one place, and and how they're actually delivered to the consumer. Um, um, if you um, if you look at the the publication that we put out this week, you'll see a, what I think is a very interesting graphic that shows uh, the composition of the companies that are providing e-commerce fulfillment services, and they, they kind of fall into several broad categories, uh, warehousing and distribution, right, which you would expect, um, um, Amazon and, and companies like Radio are, are specializing in fulfillment services, um, the parcel carriers um, have a big stake in this business, right, and you see big retailers like Walmart, Target, and, and other companies like that um, having their own system in place to provide e-commerce fulfillment. It, it really affects everything mm -hmm. that we okay. see in this marketplace. Sure. And Ashfaq, yeah. what's your take on you know, this, this move toward e-commerce and uh, e-commerce fulfillment? Uh, how do you see XPO uh, you know, really tackling this change? Yeah, you know, um, the source of uh, the change is the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, we see, you know, increasingly all of us who are also consumers buying more things online, asking for more convenience, and uh, our logistics infrastructure that exists today uh, across all of the industry is not very well suited for that. You know, um, we have spent many decades building infrastructures that you know, takes goods from manufacturers, cross docks it through a DC, and provides you know, very efficient large scale shipments coming into stores. Mm -hmm. Um, or in some cases even bypass the DC and go directly to the store. Well, those kinds of supply chains are not really well suited for this change in consumer behavior, right? So uh, we need to have more capacity in order to support more infrastructure in order to support this change. And uh, that's what XPO is involved in. And not only is the change uh, big in terms of the consumer behavior, it is also now uh, the fastest growing segment, and particularly things like heavy goods e-commerce is the fastest growing segment within e-commerce. Because consumers are now reaching a point where they're no longer uh, just buying uh, a books or clothes online. Now they've arrived at a point where they're very comfortable buying a refrigerator mm -hmm. or the next couch for the living room or your um, you know, exercise machine online. And um, in order to uh, do that, you have to think about that logistics in a much more complex way. Um, so uh, as you may know, we are the number one heavy goods uh, delivery company in this country. Uh, we do 12 million deliveries annually. So uh, we're very, very engaged with lots of companies that are in, involved in particularly the heavy goods side, but also on the, uh, on the rest of the e-commerce as well. So uh, we are engaged in, in, in building the infrastructure, finding new ways how we can provide that in a, in a high level, high quality, and an efficient manner for the consumers. Sure. You know, I just uh, ordered my own washing machine, had it delivered to my house, and ordered that online uh, just last week. So wow. uh, clearly <laughs> uh, consumer uh, 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 habits are changing. Uh, now let's go ahead and also get the perspective of somebody who uh, is specializing in e-commerce fulfillment. So Dan, you recently spoke with Stefan Weitz, who's an executive at Radial. Mm -hmm. So Dan, could you maybe set that up and tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, Stefan's background and, and what he's doing at Radial? Yes. Um, here's a guy who spent 17 years working at Microsoft and uh, his career in e-commerce goes all the way back to uh, uh, when Microsoft bought a company called eShop, right? And uh, I don't remember this, but maybe maybe you do. Uh, you use a floppy disk uh, in your uh, desktop computer to search, I don't remember that. Search, <laughs> search for goods to buy, right? We've come a long way since then. Um, um, 
Stefan was also involved with the creation of the Bing search engine at, at Microsoft. And so now he's working with a company uh, that is second only to um, Amazon in terms of the volume of goods that it ships, uh, processes and ships uh, for uh, companies uh, selling online. So let's play that interview now. Let's, let's begin by telling uh, readers uh, and viewers today um, who may not be familiar with radio, what is the company and why was it created? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so Radial is uh, the, the largest company you haven't heard of uh, in the e-commerce space. <laughs> it's, it's a company that has two sides to it. There's a technology side of the house and an operations side of the house. On the technology side, we build and maintain one of the world's most deployed uh, pieces of software for, for omni-channel. So think about omni-channel technology, uh, think about orders coming in, uh, think of distributed order management pushing out to all the, the various places where orders can be fulfilled from. We've got a product there that we've been selling uh, for a couple of years, and, and now we have about 25,000 stores actually up on, on, on that stack. We've got an entire payments, tax, and fraud stack. So it is a, uh, the ability to take money, make sure it's from the right person and not a fraudulent person. We have that. That's the technology side of the house. And the operations side of the house is all about our uh, 26 warehouses across the world, our 7,000 warehouse workers who pick, pack, and ship products for our retail customers and our brands all day long. And finally, we've got a customer service uh, part of the operation, about 4,500 call center agents who text, who chat, who uh, voice talk, the whole thing uh, to help people, to help brands and, and retailers deliver that amazing customer experience. The, the easiest way to think about us is that we are the post checkout commerce company. So for a brand or retailer, we allow them to look like Amazon in that in that buy button all the way down to delivery without having to go to Amazon to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, I think everyone knows that e-commerce is a, um, a growing business. Um, we all participate in it at, at some level, I think, nowadays. Uh, can you give us an idea of the size of the market for e-commerce fulfillment services and who the major players are in this space other than Amazon? <laughs> say. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, you, you've hit the biggest one. I mean, uh, Amazon is clearly the biggest one. You, you scope them out. Uh, it, it depends how you break up the market, honestly. If you look at uh, just B2C, so take out B2B. You know, I, I think the, the outsourced spend number I saw recently was in the, the $30 billion range, so a very, very large, uh, large range there. But that includes insourcing, and that, that includes kind of the overall overall cost, and, and it's broken up between insource providers and outsource providers. And in the space that, that I operate in, from, from, from e-commerce generally, there isn't really anyone quite like Radial. There are a lot of 3PLs, obviously, who do great work. Um, there's a lot of technology companies that do great work. There's a lot of payments companies that do great work. But as far as being the end-to-end -end throat to choke or the butt to kick, however you want to say it, uh, from whenever an order comes in to whenever the order actually lands at the customer's doorstep, um, there isn't anyone quite like Radial that has that tech and ops all blended together into one uh, uniform offering. Certainly not scale. There are some smaller guys. Uh, that have smaller operations, but at scale, it's a, it's a fairly unique offer at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little about um, what the service requirements are for companies that sell online. Um, obviously, getting the goods to the customer is a very <laughs> important piece of it. Yeah. Um, but can you talk about what you're seeing um, in the way of services that uh, your customers are asking you for and, and maybe how you see this evolving in the next few years? That's a great question. What you may be asked to do. Yeah, that's and, and a lot of times they aren't even sure what they're asking for yet. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they just know something's not working. And that's where we get called in a lot of times these days. It is, uh, oh my gosh, I'm losing share to Amazon. I'm losing share to, to upstarts in the space. Uh, I'm less profitable than I was. Or I get a lot of I'm actually growing share online. So my, my business is, you know, was 100% offline. I moved 30% of it to online. Everyone's high-fiving. They say, CEO does a great job. You did a great thing. And they go, yeah, but I'm losing money. <laughs> so they, they shift to online. They, they watch their margins compress dramatically in that online shift. So a, a, lot, of, a, lot, of what, uh, a, a lot of what I'm seeing nowadays is a recognition that Amazon is winning 
not because they have some secret magic, right? There's no, there's no, uh, there's no witch in the background doing some interesting work. Amazon is winning right now because they have figured out a way to reduce friction from the buying process, period. That's what it comes down to. So you know if you go to Amazon and you go to the site, it's super easy to search and you get back a beautiful uh, set of results that are easy to navigate. It's super easy to see uh, information about the product. It's super easy to see the reviews of the product. When you wanna buy it, you click on one button and, and if you have one click set up, you're done. It just, it's your credit card's there, your address is there, you get a confirmation 10 seconds later saying your order is placed, here's the delivery date, you can track it all the way through. If there's a problem, you simply chat, call, you get that human being on the phone to resolve your issues quickly at a high quality. That's what they've done. They, they've eliminated any reason for you to abandon that transaction and go somewhere else. The challenge that most retailers and brands have today is that they can't do that. That's what I'm seeing right now that retailers are struggling with. It is that making a seamless, friction-free customer experience doing it at a price they can afford, because that's the other dirty little secret, obviously, is Amazon doesn't really make any money in retail. So they, they give you that amazing experience. It comes at a high cost. I mean, last year, they, I, think they, I think they spent, they collected $12 billion, I'm sorry, they spent $12 billion in the shipping fees and they collected seven. So they lost $5 billion in shipping fees. That's, not, that's, that's bigger than the market cap for most companies I'm talking to at this point. So it, it's a bit of an unfair thing. Retailers and brands are competing against this friction-free experience. They're, they're doing it against a competitor who doesn't necessarily have to make money in retail. Uh, they make money other places. Uh, and as a result, every decision they have to make in that e-commerce value chain has to be one where they are questioning the, the, the best way to do it. What's the cheapest, highest quality way I can do this? And the challenge they have today is yeah, doing, it, uh, doing it in pieces and doing it themselves is, is just it is too hard, frankly. All right, welcome back. Uh, let's go ahead and get to some of the viewer questions we've received about e-commerce. Uh, we've gotten questions on how e-commerce will affect uh, the intermodal industry, uh, LTL carriers, um, even package carriers, you know, uh, of course, there's going to be more emphasis on, you know, the speed of fulfillment, you know, move to, uh, you know, two-day or even same-day delivery. Uh, but, um, Ashfaq, would you have anything to add on uh, how e-commerce is going to uh, affect different aspects of, of the supply chain? Well, uh, you know, I think I touched on it a few yeah. minutes ago. Um, E-commerce is going to change, uh, you know, the infrastructure and how we deliver services. And there's a lot more innovation that is happening. There's a lot of people in our industry that are trying out new things. Um, we are very engaged with many of them. And, you know, with our last mile, uh, you know, uh, business, we are very engaged in them. There's also a lot of innovation that's going on within the four walls of the warehouse. Uh, if you think about it, when you go into a retail store, it's not just a place for you to pick up. The retailer wants you to have an experience that reflects their brand. Well, online retailers also want to do the same. And so in our business, the services that logistics providers are bringing to the table is more than just the physical distribution of goods. It's helping our customer extend their brand identity to the end consumer. So uh, we are being more sophisticated. We are inventing new things. It's an exciting time to be in e-commerce. Okay, and we also got an interesting question about uh, what should we expect to see, what changes should we expect to see in the future uh, in regards to um, making um, distribution in urban areas you know, less congested, more efficient. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, of course, uh, you know, we have a uh, number of the small parcel companies and, and technology companies looking at, uh, you know, everything from drones to, uh, you know, vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles, working with drones and all those kinds of things. So those are all interesting things and I think, uh, you know, uh, those technologies have a pretty high bar, a lot of challenge to overcome, but tremendous ideas. I mean, uh, today we do, um, you know, distribution in New York was the most dense urban uh, places in the world. Mm -hmm. We use people on foot, we use yeah. couriers. Right. And that seems to work very well today. So, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we are watching, but uh, humans are the way to go for now, okay. I think. <laughs> uh, we're, we're watching as well. Um, and 
You know, another aspect of logistics that we've heard a lot about recently uh, has been uh, often referred to as the Uberization of freight. You know, obviously that's a probably an overused moniker. Um, you know, especially now that Uber is, is looking to get into it as well, uh, perhaps we should find a better term, but it does have some real implications for transportation logistics. Um, you know, and a, a freight, freight brokerage is sometimes seen as the target of this disruption uh, where uh, these, these startups have been entering the industry looking to uh, automate manual processes, use mobile apps, uh, just make uh, freight transactions simpler and, and more efficient. So, um, you know, earlier this year at, at Stiefel's Transportation Logistics Conference, I heard several uh, executives at large freight brokers, in, including uh, uh, Brad Jacobs of XBO, uh, discuss this. And, and um, uh, Brad's comment was that uh, XBO sees itself as part of that uh, movement with the use of technology uh, rather than uh, something, you know, a company that's, that's, you know, responding or resisting, you know, resisting it. Um, but, um, I would like to ask uh, um, you, Ashfaq, uh, to comment on how you see this, this Uberization trend that we, we describe it as uh, evolving. So, um, you know, we know and we believe that, you know, over time the uh, process of uh, matching uh, customers with demand, with carriers with capacity will get more and more automated through the use of technology. And uh, we are, you know, investing heavily in that process ourselves. Uh, Every year we're much more automated. We have much more intelligence um, in that. Um, and uh, in order to do that, it's not just about uh, the technology. It's also about analytics and data behind it because that's what really drives the pricing and the decision making. But uh, in really, the biggest challenge that we see in this area is not technology. It's really the risk perception in the mind of the carrier in the mind of the customer. Um, you know, technology can be adapted to do, uh, you know, all those things that, you know, can make this more seamless. And I think uh, us and many others in the industry are well on our way to, to do that. But unlike, um, you know, maybe a consumer-oriented uh, world, uh, if you, you know, the, 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 the challenge for a carrier or a customer to make a wholesale switch to a brand new unproven technology puts a very significant part of their business at risk. And we don't see customers or carriers really jumping to that. So this, we expect this to be gradual or at least uh, uh, delayed until the technology is proven and reliable so uh, customers can make that switch uh, without a, a great deal of perception of risk. Okay, great. Um, now one of the technology companies, one of the, the, the sort of new players that is uh, often kind of lumped into this category of uh, Ubers for trucking is a company called Transfix. So a few weeks ago at the Mid-America Trucking Show, I had the chance to speak with Eric Ma, who's the head of product at Transfix, and I asked him about this trend, and uh, you know, here's what he had to say. Let's go ahead and play that interview. Thank you, Eric, for joining us. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure that uh, some of our uh, audience has heard of you guys, but some of them uh, I'm sure have not. So perhaps you can give me a quick overview of what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Transfix, we are a digital freight broker, and we are very much focused on creating technologies to dramatically simplify and make the process of connecting carriers and shippers mm -hmm. in a much more automated fashion. So a lot okay. of what we're focused on is making, finding, and booking loads as simple as possible. Okay, so I know you guys are among the companies that are often kind of lumped into <laughs> this trend, this uh, category that's sort of being described as the, you know, the Ubers of trucking, the Uberization of trucking. So I want to get your thoughts on that term. Uh, you know, how does it apply? How doesn't it apply? Right. Uh, do you like it, not like it? And uh, uh, what do you see happening out there in the market in, in relation to that? Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, it's a very, you know, loaded term. Um, I think that for us, what we really think about is kind of what did change in the taxi industry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was just how technology just dramatically, again, made things more efficient when connecting the consumer with uh, the driver themselves. Yep. And I think that for us, that's a, there's a lot of analogous kind of um, opportunities from the brokerage space. And okay. so we're very focused on helping our drivers, our carriers, 
find freight in the most effective, consistent manner possible, make it very transparent, very simple to actually just run their business and not have to worry about, you know, where will I find my next load or anything like that. Okay. Um, of course, beyond that, there are a lot of times when that analogy starts breaking down, right? Sure. Obviously, somebody's not on their phone looking to move freight, you know, across right. the country last second or anything like right. that. But yeah. yeah. It's a matter of complexity, of course, with commercial transportation compared right. to, right. to ride right. sharing. Right. Um, but could you maybe uh, give us a profile of a typical Transfix customer? Uh, who are some of the, you know, I guess, companies that you guys typically work with? So a lot of um, our customers can range from people who are actually retailers and yep. need to um, sell and move freight from distribution centers out to their stores, mm -hmm. or it may be individuals who do, that do not actually have retail stores themselves, right. but are trying to move um, you know, their goods to whichever appropriate customer might. And a lot of our ways of working with them just, again, involves their different needs, figuring out how we can actually help their supply chains and those various aspects of needs, and then connecting it with all the different carriers in our network. Okay. And uh, of course, when you look at you know, the established um, you know, third-party logistics market out there, some of the large players, the large freight brokers, uh, of course, also have embraced technology, are using uh, technology as a uh, you know, differentiator in their market. And you know, examples are you know, CH Robinson, XPO Logistics, uh, Echo Global Logistics, um, you know, Total Quality Logistics, just to name you know, yep. several there. Uh, so they're, they're also using technology to kind of you know, automate the freight transaction process. Um, but at the same time, of course, there are many others, you know, freight brokerages out there who still rely heavily on manual phone calls. Yep. Um, you know, could you maybe contrast what you guys do with what some of the large 3PLs are doing and, and uh, you know, how do you compare? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that what's been really exciting to see is just how much technology is really transforming this industry, just mm -hmm. the way that everybody is trying to use it to make their own internal processes more efficient. I think that the big difference for us is that from you know, day one or day zero, technology has been in our DNA. So yeah. everything that we're building is using a technology first standpoint. And you, know, you spoke about how so much is still reliant on phone calls and mm -hmm. those different things. I think for us, we're constantly thinking, do we actually need to even add a phone call to our process versus how do we remove the phone call out of the traditional process? Right. Mm -hmm. And so instead, we're actually defaulting to figuring out where does tech yeah. step in, automate a lot of the processes, reduce yep. a lot of the time that our company doesn't need to spend, sure. and then pass along those you know, efficiencies and savings onto our customers and onto our carriers. Okay. And how far can we go with automation? You know, because uh, we, we, you look for the opportunities to, to do things more easily, yep. you know, look for opportunities for technology to streamline the process. Uh, what role does the traditional human uh, you know, freight broker have in this? Uh, is, is there still a, a role for that? Yep. Uh, what do you see in the, in the future? So we believe that there's definitely always going to be a requirement for you know, a human to be involved, right. um, just for you know, understanding the customized needs of customers, mm -hmm. of carriers, and to maintain those relationships. Yep. What we really think that will slowly move away, or maybe not so slowly, are all of the things that can be removed and be just automated and done in a much more efficient manner. Again, removing the matching that traditionally is done in a more somebody connecting two different right. you know, individuals together, all of that we think can be automated away. And then our team gets to focus more on, again, the human touches, the, yeah, the relationships, right. understanding how can we help a business, how can we help a carrier, and just really you know, grow with them. All right, we're back. Let's go ahead and uh, hit a few more viewer questions. Uh, so we got a couple questions uh, dealing with uh, what 3PLs look for in carriers. Uh, one's from uh, Midwest Motor Express. Uh, what is the primary factor that sets a carrier apart from their peers in the eyes of a 3PL? Uh, is it pricing, service levels, uh, technology, all of the above? Uh, what do you guys look for at, at uh, XPO? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. You know, pricing, you know, uh, making sure they deliver on time, you know, safety record. Okay. And then I uh, also had some questions I want to hit here dealing with um, transportation efficiency. So we, we had three questions that you know, touch on this. 
uh, you know, how important uh, to your shippers, or at least to some of your shippers, is a fleet's you know, MPG, efficiency, potentially uh, alternative fuels? Uh, how, how much of a focus do you do? How, how often does that come up in your conversations? Um, you know, it does come up. Uh, I think uh, depending on the brand image of our customer, there are customers who are sensitive. Uh, but, uh, in the, and, and, you know, uh, we have a project right now in Paris where we are uh, utilizing natural gas vehicles to do deliveries exactly for that reason, to reduce the uh, carbon footprint. But if I look at the broad array of shippers, I think price is still the dominant, you know, uh, driver of selection. But I would say that, you know, more and more customers are at least starting to measure and starting to be aware of, of that, and I think over time uh, we'll see that uh, you know, concern uh, be more and more reflected in their procurement decisions. Okay. And we also had an interesting forward-looking question about uh, the top challenges you see for logistics companies in uh, 2020 and beyond. So what, what do you see as the, the top challenges for this, this sector uh, down the line? Well, uh, you know, for XPO, now that we finally got to number one spot, that would be a challenge for us to <laughs> retain our number one spot. <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, you know, uh, I think um, there are some trends that are happening in our industry that have a pretty big effect. Uh, you know, there's a lot of new technologies, pretty dramatic technologies that are coming at us. You know, we talked about autonomous vehicles. We talked about drones. We talked about ro robotic things. You know, the business a a data analytics capability, there's also Internet of Things, which we didn't really talk much about today. These are all things that are going to have an effect from a technology standpoint. The second big trend is the trend of consumer behaviors changing. It's a major part of the economy, and there's a dramatic shift, and that probably has an even bigger effect than technology in our business. And then finally, I think, you know, our business, uh, you know, our industry, uh, is uh, very fragmented and is going through consolidation and that trend will continue. So these are three things that we will see, I think, over the course of the uh, next few years. And, uh, you know, all of us uh, in the industry are going to, uh, you know, kind of have the, have the challenge of trying to balance, uh, you know, and how we navigate our companies uh, through all of those trends. Great. Well, thank you for the conversation. Uh, but that's going to do it for today's show. Uh, Dan and I uh, would like to extend our thanks to XPO's Oshfak Chowdhury for joining us in the studio today. Uh, we also want to thank John Larkin of Stiefel, Stefan Weitz of Radial, and Eric Ma of Transfix for their participation. And as a reminder, you can check out the complete Top 50 Logistics rankings on our website right now. We'd also like to extend our thanks to Ryder and Telegis for sponsoring today's show. If you missed part of the show or would just like to watch it again, a replay will be posted later today on our website, ttnews.com, and on liveonweb.ttnews.com. Our next Live on Web program is scheduled for June 14th, when we will get you up to speed on the latest developments in autonomous trucking. Until then, on behalf of Dan and myself, thank you for joining us.